Great. Well, good evening, everybody. Great to see so many people here. I'm uh, Professor Claire Taylor, Deputy Vice Chancellor here at Wrexham Glyndor University, and it's my absolute pleasure uh, to welcome you to Professor Alex Shepley's inaugural professorial lecture this evening. So um, Alex said to keep the introduction short because he's got plenty to say. Uh, and as you know, when Alec gets going, he's got plenty to say. So you're in for a real treat this evening. So Alec is head of the School of Creative Arts and Professor of Contemporary Art Practice here at the university. He's held a number of senior posts uh, in higher education across the UK and has been a practicing artist for over 30 years. Alec's individual and collaborative research has attracted funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, the British Council, the Arts Council of England and the Arts Council of Wales. There's a lot of people interested in Alec's work and his work has been exhibited widely both nationally and internationally with pieces held in a number of public and private collections in North America, Europe and across Asia. Through extending the language of painting and sculpture, his works have become more a means of encounter rather than <coughs> an end in themselves, providing a document of art as social engagement. Through intertwining reality and fiction, he produces improvised sites of engagement, often unwittingly with members of the public. And I guess we are due to be engaged, perhaps unwittingly, <laughs> yeah. with that ourselves this evening. Yeah. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Professor Alex Shepley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, thank you for coming. It's great to see so many people here. Can you all hear me? Yeah, good. Uh, so, yeah, the title, um, somebody commented, they'd spotted that the title had changed from the previous iteration. It, there are actually seven titles to this talk because I couldn't make my mind up. And then I thought, it doesn't actually matter what it's called. It's what am I going to say. So I'm going to talk about my artistic research and, and how it emerges in the interdisciplinary space of art, architecture and social practice. I'll mention some early projects, probably very briefly, and then spend more time around three recent ones, uh, one in Scotland, one in England and one in India. I'll look at the role of improvisation, how a peripatetic and arguably post-organisational artistic cultural tendency attempts to bring art and art practice outside traditional institutional settings and through questioning things like the frame, how it embeds within the contours of contemporary urban landscapes. In other words, my engagement with the paradox that non-art is more art than art-art and non-art it was invented by uh, Alan Capra, or he's claiming he invented it. It's whatever has not been accepted as art, but has caught an artist's attention with that possibility in mind. So it remains a possibility that it might become art. But to start with, here's an early piece from around 30 years ago, or 30 odd years ago, when I first started out on my artistic journey. It's one of a series of assemblages and in fact the only surviving one because they were made on 35 mil slides and I subsequently lost them. It was made in situ in a row of derelict houses next door to the art school where I was studying just outside Manchester and through a painstaking process of working and reworking this domestic debris that I found in the building which is an old kitchen drawer and a galvanised handle, um, working and reworking the material. I learnt on this journey how to draw uh, and about painting without paint, if you can imagine such a thing. I learnt about context, I represented that by the image on the left, which is the Nativity by Piero. Skills uh, and interpretation, so how you take um, a context, a set of skills and reinterpret it in your own way. I also learnt about occupying void spaces, these spaces that are perhaps forgotten. Uh, Matter Clark, Corda Matter Clark, who an, an artist from the 70s, 
He talked a lot about occupying void spaces, gaps, leftover spaces, places where you stop to tie your shoelaces, things that are slightly off piste, places that are just interruptions in daily movements and habits. And the more I've thought about that, the closer affinity I've felt with that area of engagement. And the town where I lived had a lot of these uh, void spaces. The town was peppered with what I thought were inside outside spaces. So you're driving along the road with my dad in Staley Bridge, thinking about why we could see people's private dwellings exposed as if they'd been severed by an unseen hand. And to my young self, they seemed strangely paradoxical uh, spaces to play. places to make art and this image here is of Daniel Buren, a French artist who I've always been very fond of. He said in a, an essay in the, I think about 1971, that the work of art in its place of making is in its uh, place, its own closest reality. Um, a closest reality from which it will continue to distance itself because he believed that um, although its place of making was the studio, um, once it's left the studio, it's prone to manipulation and additions and it accrues all kinds of value and meaning that the artist may or may not have intended as it sets out on its journey from its place of making. And this seemed to fit with my on-site activity quite nicely. And this is a piece of work by Buren from 73, uh, it's called Within and Beyond the Frame, and it's a picture from the Leo Castelli Gallery. There's a 190-foot long row of 19 grey and white striped canvases, and it basically uh, punctures out the gallery space into the street beyond. It, it points to this conundrum of the frame, and to most of us, the frame is the the big gold thing that's around a piece of work, or if it's a sculpture, it's a, a plinth. Either way, it's a marker of limits. It's an impermeable boundary around something. Whereas Buren was doing something quite crazy and sending it straight out across the street, uh, questioning all kinds of things about permanence, placement, oddity. And really, he was playing with this idea that uh, on the one hand, this frame is an impermeable boundary, a marker of limits, but on the other, according to Jacques Derrida, it's much more complex than that. The frame is a construct. It's temporary, therefore fragile. He suggested that it forms another piece of work. A paragon was the word he used, a by-work. It's a place between that which you deem to be the art and that which you deem to be not art, and there's a space in between which is slightly um, ambiguous, and it's that bit that I'm interested in. So just a kind of model there, very, you can see a window into my thinking of simplifying things. You've got your first frame and your second frame. The first frame is this one around the piece of work, the second one's the institutional frame. So you can already see that I'm beginning to think about art as a situation as opposed to an object, especially perhaps when you look at this slide from a book about literature actually by Abrams, about, it's called The Mirror and the Lamp, and it talks about the artwork being in a situation between universe, artist and audience, as opposed to something that's fixed in time and space permanently and forever unchanging. So, According to Joseph Kossuth, another artist, American artist, the first frame is the physical one around the work and the second one is the conceptual one, an institutional one. For me, it fluctuates or vibrates between the two. So to me, it seemed at best provisional and that suited me. So I set about making situated and provisional artworks, often ones that, as Claire said, implicates the onlooker and my own presence as a component part. So what does all that mean in material expression? 
I've got a few examples. I'm just going to whiz through these. This is one from 1985. I studied in America as part of my degree and I learned how to make neon glass sculpture and I made this kind of step up, step down, walk around uh, thing. Uh, it was called environmental art then. It wasn't called installation art. And I had in mind this nonsensical door that Duchamp had made in 1927. This door in uh, Rue Larry, Paris, when it's closed, the other one's open, it, it kind of doesn't work because there's one door but two frames and he's playing around with that idea of function and non-function and stupidity as well, which I quite like. There's another one from the 80s. Uh, it's me with a, a hat I bought in America, actually, doing some drawing in Albert Square in Manchester. Uh, but I actually invited people to come and draw through the polythene, what was on the other side. And as soon as they started to draw, they were immediately tracing this lovely line of buildings behind Manchester Town Hall and whatnot. But then when they moved their head, the whole thing changed and we all got confused. And it, then we all had a laugh about it and it created this crazy big event as part of a festival. We were one little part of a Manchester festival. And it led to other invitations to do stuff. This is one from the 90s where it was called Testing, Testing, Testing. And I built a large uh, frame. It's, it's scaffolding and debris netting and it's meant to be a kind of metaphor for a, a canvas. So you've got, for those of you who paint the canvas stretcher and you've got canvas as a, as a substrate. It was a kind of 3D painting. And I lit it up as a lantern with a big picture of a bird that was preening itself so it became a kind of bird cage, but it was only over a four week period that I arrived at this outcome. There was a lot of messing about with the scaffolding, rebuilding, taking it apart, and eventually it ended up at the big, this big cube. Um, so it was about being there in the space, as a, in the gallery, treating the gallery as a studio. Back in the studio, I had, at this time, stu two studios. I had one across the road from my house, and I had one in a Victorian cotton mill. And this was an experiment that I did. And I'm, this is one of the pieces of work that I'm most fond of, where I've taken some debris and for the first time brought together the debris, this idea of ruin, um, void spaces, to create something for me which I, I felt visu visually arresting and created what I became I came to call tableau or living paintings where I'd again paint without paint and set something up and then photograph it and that would be it, it would all go. So temporariness, ephemeral. And I got invited to do a project in Winnipeg in the late 90s, 1999 that period. And I rebuilt that studio in the gallery in Winnipeg and then lit it with neon. There was this fantastic neon factory in Winnipeg and I became good friends with Jeff, the chap that uh, ran it and, you know, he could see I'd got no money but he liked the idea of doing it so we built this thing together and then I decided it was really not good enough so I destroyed it and then rebuilt something from the destruction and that, that's when it became the thing. I'd gone over there, I think I was going to rebuild the studio. I did it and then realised it was so... It, it just didn't work. It needed to be disrupted in some way. So physically it was chopped up and put back together with neon. That was over five or six weeks in that gallery, um, doing that. Um, this is a much more recent one where it was called Waiting Room at X Church in Gainsborough, where I was there for months actually, and I went there with no plan uh, at the invitation of the director there, Marcus Hammond. He intentionally wanted me to go there because I would be there. Some days I would do nothing, I would just talk to people or get roped into jobs. Um, which suited me, actually, because I was trying to find a place that was 
not an art gallery, not a studio, to engage in what I would call non-art activities because it was the engagement that was after. So it led to all kinds of crazy situations. And somebody thought I'd been to a kind of management uh, training session and had gone a bit <laughs> crazy because I was stupid enough to put that on Facebook. Um, but it was the result of asking the, the people there for ideas about what, what we should be doing together. And the result was um, lots and lots of things, actually. Lots of events, if you like. It was almost like a kind of series of little micro-engagements, I would call them, where I would involve myself and others in making games, painting, drawing. I bought a shed, put it on wheels so we could wheel it around. Did workshops about uh, writing stories and doing postcards. Uh, this was a postcard one where I asked people to send a postcard describing or drawing where they were at that moment and then posting it to me and we made a display of it in the, in the, in the space. And it was quite, um, I don't know, it was, it was very, 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 well, I can't think of the word, it was fantastic. I was very touched by the, the number of people who sent postcards because we did it via social media. And in the meantime, we were busily building stuff as well, sheds that became skips um, made out of things that people had donated. A local company donated a big pallet full of doors and we thought, what can we do with this? Well, how can we make art with nothing? Um, and how can we put that art in people's way and say, deal with it? So me and this gang of followers, we, we did just that. Uh, it was a good time. And very, very recently, I've involved myself in the Llangollen Fringe Festival, another collaboration with, uh, with them, particularly Paul Keddy, who helped me with the electrical stuff and produced this kind of lantern building. Hopefully this works. But basically it's the old print works in Berwyn and we lit it up like a magic lantern and the LED lights just pulsated and changed colour through the spectrum for um, several days. And it was, it was um, again, making work with people who may be artists, may not be artists, um, and producing something well, that we thought, well, I thought was quite spectacular because when it actually happened, the, the light up ceremony, if you like, was at night, obviously. Um, and a situation like this, actually, where we had a microphone and we had the bandstand and this big crowd turned up and then we had a switch on and I, hadn't, I didn't know if it was going to switch on. And as I was apologising for it maybe not switching on, it all came on behind me. And so that was quite a good moment. So again, working in a kind of non-gallery setting um, and I just want to make a mention to this contradictory domain between the object and the subject, between people and art objects. It's that between space that I think is the space with most energy. And um, I wanted to reference our very own Sue Liggett, who's the reader in fine art here at uh, Glyndor University. I'm sorry for embarrassing you, but she talks about psychological resonance as a metaphoric vibration resulting from an inner dialogue between subject and object. And that really struck a, a light on my, in my head. As an artist and teacher, I concern myself with learning how to better articulate this psychological resonance. That's the thing that we're trying to open up in the mind of the student, this contradictory space in which all art must find itself and how we accommodate that in our art schools. And it's led me to do work on the idea of art schools as um, what, what's called heterotopia, a kind of different kind of space. Creativity is the result of a dialogue between self and other, subject and object. And that meaning or reality does not reside in the subject or the object, but the dynamic flow between them. And it's a shame Maria's not here because I think she would have liked this <laughs> dub double, triple helix. Um, between practice, teaching and research, that sets up a kind of dynamic in the studio, whether it be theatre, fine art, dance, music, illustration, applied arts, whatever. But it's all about 
this dynamic between the production, the situation and audience. And I think for me, the audience at the very first outset is, is me. And that might be the same for a lot of makers, a lot of practitioners that the, the audience at the first port of call is probably you because you're the one having that dynamic conversation with, with the work that you make. But it's interesting that that all added up to this strange, absurd practice of sweeping. And it came from the above set of concerns and everyday routine within the studio, which was outside of practice. And yet the more I thought about it, the more apparent it became as, a, as being a more important to me as a kind of left field position, I standing beside myself, knowing that that's not quite possible. But once that got into my head, I had to act on it. I couldn't just leave it alone. And the result was the collision of an art practice on the one hand with a mundane studio routine I'd been carrying out for a number of years on the other. The result of which was one of the oddest occupations I've ever engaged in, often with hilarious and unforeseen consequences. I've got a whole range of photographs of me doing this, but these are just four of them. And the two projects I mentioned earlier in that very contradictory domain are these two. One on the left is St. Peter's Seminary in Codross on the west coast of Scotland. And the one on the right is Connaught Place in Delhi. And they're both iterations of what I'm calling an everyday practice from the summer and autumn of 2014. The one on the left eventually became known as I am from Leonia, and the one on the right became known as a place of impossibility. And they're quite different locations geographically, and yet in many ways quite similar. Both are architectural sites, sites originally formed out of an optimistic vision of the future, but now in a state of neglect. These spaces offered potential escape routes where I could experiment, and so in the spring of 2014, I applied for and received a small travel grant to test out my ideas. So project one, I am from Leonia, is at St. Peter's Seminary in Kilmer Hugh Codross. Uh, I just happened upon it one day when I was out for a walk with my sister actually, and uh, I thought, why haven't you told me about this place? You know, I never asked. So hopefully this will play. I am from Leonia. The city of Leonia refashions itself every day. Every morning, the people wake between fresh sheets, wash with just unwrapped cakes of soap, wear brand new clothing, take from the latest model refrigerator still unopened tins, listening to the last minute jingles from the most up-to-date radio. On the sidewalks, encased in spotless plastic bags, the remains of yesterday's Leonia await the garbage truck. Not only squeezed tubes of toothpaste, blown out light bulbs, newspapers, containers, wrappings, but also boilers, encyclopedias, pianos, porcelain dinner services. It is not so much by the things that There's each day are manufactured. There's a lot to get through, so I'm not going to play the whole film. Sold. I'll just leave it playing in the background for a minute or two. But essentially, I'm acting and thinking through the persistence of art as a system that uncovers spaces of potential through dispersed and uncertain practices. I'm trying to highlight the creative potential of doubt, of the unnoticed, the everyday, the fragment, the uncertain, the ambivalent. I say system, but it's probably more of a routine, like a maintenance programme, one inhabiting non-spaces such as ruins or cracks, gaps and openings in the vacant or abandoned buildings. The routine somehow conjures a contrast between the theatrical on the one hand and the banal and the everyday on the other and a kind of curious, out of the ordinary, ordinariness, if there is such a thing. And according to one commentator, a choreography of a kind of bathos, 
a derivistic sweeping or cleaning takes place. Siegfried Krakauer wrote about these seemingly purposeless and empty moments which infiltrate everyday life, such as that of the pedestrian, the commuter, or the person waiting in the queue. In his final and unfinished book, he referred to the terra incognita, where objectives and modes of being which still lack a name and hence overlooked or misjudged can be rehabilitated. Sweeping felt appropriate as an everyday practice and sweeping around the ruins of St. Peter's had a certain logic to it. As if I was curating my own dissolution as an artist into a practitioner of the everyday. Contemplating the notion of indefiniteness as a practice, speculating on the insistence of a procedure that uncovers the spaces of potential allowed a feral voice within me a chance to speak. And this is from an essay that Dean Hughes wrote. As an artwork, I am from Leonia is filled with futility. There seems little tangible attempt to actually cleanse the space in any demonstrable sense. This feeling is enhanced when in one sequence the figure's attention is centered upon sweeping along a shadow cast by the ruins distinctive vaulted ceilings. What could be filled with more purposeful purposelessness than following a contour whose only certainty is that it will have shifted as soon as one has completed the activity following along its path. This unassailable quality is further testified to when the figure diligently sweeps along the edge of that would have been a balcony, seemingly oblivious to the genuine detritus which constitutes the floor below. Neither is the sweeping piecemeal in the way that it might be conducted if one was passing time within monotonous employment. The sweeping is carried through with diligence and attentiveness to the job at hand that seems at odds with the apparent situation at hand. The protagonist within the video is intent on moving and remodeling matter rather than making a new construction or order. The video presents itself as a tension. What is the nature of this sweeping? What is its purpose? The action is carried out and performed with a sensitivity removed from simple cleaning. What indeed could be cleaned? The figure seems to be part archeologist, unsure of the status of what is being dislodged, moved and uncovered. There is equal reverie being given to dust and dirt as there is to surface. I think about cleaning and the points at which cleaning occurs after a party after a meal, before and after visitors. All moments similar to these are epiphanies within our lives when compared to the next act of removing and discarding after the event. I wonder if cleaning is ever the event or is it resigned to be the melancholy moment after the fact? So this next project is called The Cabinet of Ambivalence. From 2015. The non-art mundane routine has become more than that, a ritual of entry or exit from one world to another. It serves as an interregnum or period of self-imposed waiting, what Stephen Wright calls a form of paradoxical escapology. He says, escapology, broadly speaking, refers to the rapidly growing field of empirical inquiry and speculative research into the ways and means, tactics and strategies of escaping capture, quote unquote. He goes on to describe how this relies on operative or performative capture whereby things are put to work, made to perform, and how escapology is the theory and practice of suspending the operations of all these mechanisms of capture, and yet escapology is a paradoxical undertaking and an often ambivalent science. For obvious reasons, escape itself can neither assert itself for what it is, nor perform itself as escape. It must always appear impossible. 
renegotiating the relationship, the boundaries, meaning, form, material, and testing out whether a work could perhaps be not of art, as Duchamp once asked in 1913, locates practice specifically in the quotidian, in the repetitive tasks I do on a daily basis, such as walking, cleaning, cooking, and waiting. Kicking fragments down the path, sweeping particles, dust and contouring cracks, joins and crumbling architectural features all provide the marginal spaces I need for dispersals, ones that do not stand for anything certain and are in a state of intercession. And this is key. Through enacting what have become uncertain practices and made up ad hoc, on the spot, nomadic routines and games, I'm attempting a kind of spontaneous philosophy to live in a drawing, as Gramsci once put it. Meandering and impromptu arts practice is a means of resisting the market. It can surface social issues and serve as a catalyst for change. Most important to me though is that it foregrounds the notion that art is most alive in its own space of making. It's a moment, it's a realization, it's a sensation, an understanding. It may be embodied by an artifact, but that is just the catalyst and through my work I aim to demonstrate how the use of both the improvised, the fragmentary and the impoverished signifies a continued turn towards art as exchange over commodity. The occupation of ruin as a positive trope of reflexivity has led to what I would call urban contouring procedures to uncover spaces of potential, make comment on our condition and look for new directions. I'm drawn to artists whose work critiques institutions that define art as art and that have traditionally distributed it and hope to demonstrate how this process might allow new voices to emerge through dispersed practice. There is a cultural and aesthetic value in the encounters discussed. Their effective relationship to self can be outlined alongside the blurring of fictive boundaries between public and private life and ultimately call them into question. Ephemerality, certain media choices, and the presence of the artist are artistic strategies used by artists such as Marcel Duchamp, Alan Caprao, Fluxus, Marcel Brothers. What happened then? Uh, these artists, like Francis Alice, Stanley Brown, Mirla Lardeman, Ukulees, and many others, these artists engage, perform, discuss, perceive, and realize works that occupy this paragon this between space, the boundaries between art and life, and even call into question the place and purpose of art. Artists incorporate in their own labour and that of others as the artwork in relation to traditional forms of object creation for market exchange intrigue me. Why? Because they foreground the complexity, art as process, not just object. And freeing myself from the perceived confines of my own conventions remains as important to me now as it ever was, maybe even more. And if you want to go further and disrupt the understanding of what art is, you need to alter how it gets to audience. And this brings me on to this quote by Marcel Brothers, who lived in a jar. The definition of artistic activity occurs, first of all, in the field of distribution. So what is saying is that art seems to inhabit a spatio-temporal zone as opposed to a fixed or constant point in time and space. And this was a result of the tendency to resist or even escape the market's inclination to commodify culture. And this shift in the framing of art has implications for the viewer since the shift from the material, first frame, remember, to the institutional, second frame, would in some way implicate the viewer within the work, knowingly or unknowingly, even as co-creator. The use of the artwork surrounding as part of the work situates the viewer within the second frame. So part, project three, is this one called Insert 
2014, and it's a huge project in Delhi, um, 2013 and 2014. In the autumn of 2013, there was an open call for speculations from artists, curators, writers, architects, cultural practitioners and activists for the reimagination of spaces and cultural infrastructure in Delhi. Rooks Media Collective, the Delhi-based artistic and curatorial collective, invited proposals for the imaginative rethinking of unused public spaces and cultural infrastructure in Delhi. The call was a provocation for artists and cultural practitioners to rediscover the city's cultural and artistic potential through imaginative transformations. And the result was a series of conversations initiated by artists from all over the world and congregating in Delhi throughout that year, or certainly the first half of that year. My project, A Place of Impossibility, was among the 25 submissions invited to show in the exhibition New Models for Common Ground at the Mati Gar, or Mud House, um, which also was quite a fortunate and appealing place to show work, at the Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts in February 2014 as part of this insert 2014. Rooks Media Collective selected Delhi as a site for insert, both for conceptual and logistical reasons. Delhi is where the collective was founded in 1992 and has been their base ever since. But for the chairman of the Inlax Shivdasani Foundation, Azad Shivdasani, the sponsor of the event, his main concern was that the event should be socially relevant. This is reflected in the kind of artists who were invited to uh, show or take part, such as the Taiwanese artist Yao Ju Chung from Taipei, who said, derelict buildings can naturally make for a good metaphor, a symbol for a certain state of mind, as our circumstances and our background can be seen in a similar way as derelict buildings pending redevelopment or construction. Derelict buildings provide a kind of creative energy that can be harnessed by artists. And it threw me right back to when I was a teenager in those bomb sites making stuff. My speculative project was based in an area around Connaught Place, um, known as, um, uh, sorry, including Palika Bazaar Park and an abandoned office building known locally as Skipper Tower, which was this last, this image. Street encounters, walks or happenings were proposed as a way for the artist to directly experience the selected sites, encounter those people who lived and worked there and document the process using photography and video. The Skipper Tower has come to symbolise for many the image of modernity in the form of a ruin from the future and was seen by the project curator's rooks as a definitely one that could fuel micro-engagements. And the district around Connaught Place is one of the most popular public places of Delhi and attracts people from all walks of life, from homeless vagabonds to office workers, from college students to compulsive loners and many others besides. Connaught Place, popularly known as CP, is known not only for its nostalgic historicity and impressive built heritage, but also for the sheer vitality of changing urban life with all its fullness and diversity. And you can probably guess what I did. Yes. Benjamin wrote, the bazaar is the last hangout of the flaneur. And I was set on inserting myself here with my sweeping brush, meandering through the spaces and contouring the intersecting lines which divide and subdivide the city's lots towards a mobile practice. And experiencing at such a slow tortoise like pace contrasted quite a lot with the effects of a large, noisy, fast-moving city which seemed to never sleep. The popular park, busy with people from all walks of life, served to foreground the large edifice of the modern office block, void of people, and produced many ad hoc micro-engagements with local people, visitors and groups of tourists milling around in the mix. 
It also included an altercation with a young girl who thought I'd stolen the sweeping brush from her mother, who was a park cleaner. And being unable to communicate with her, it got quite scary, even though she was only <coughs> yay high. Although a very lively place with large numbers of people present at any given time of the day, the area is in decline. Actually, some of it's in decline, some of it's been gentrified. But the overall infrastructure is in a state of decay. One of the curatorial aims of INSERT was to inaugurate a rethinking of place in a contemporary art fashion as an active presence. So it was a kind of verb as opposed to a noun. And the foregrounding of the poetics of usage was seen as a vital part of art's inhabitation with life. And the project that I proposed for these sites was situated therefore within this broader context and included myself as an actor of a nomadic and fragmented practice with an aim to occupy spaces seemingly void of artistic activity or any activity. By inserting myself this way as a means to subvert and affect rhetorical frameworks and structures to reimagine these spaces, or at least their potential to be reimagined through artistic engagement. And this is important as the idea behind insert was that of acting as a provocation for artists and cultural practitioners to discover and propose ideas that can be leveraged, adapted and transformed to lay the foundations for a distinct and dynamic art and culture scene. The point of departure for this event, therefore, is not an artwork as such, but a practice, somehow almost a chaotic or an inv invitation to be chaotic. However, given the history and context of the location, its current condition and the potential for my status as an artist to be perceived, that is meant to be happy when I said chaotic. Um, as an unwanted intrusion, i.e. being parachuted in to an area to engage in some kind of development activity, I decided to adopt a point of departure as my main focus of activity and to introduce into a public setting for the first time this studio procedure, that of sweeping the floor. Through the drifts, the series of drifts, through the proposed sites in Delhi, my proposal was to experience current conditions explore and document any apparent dilapidations and deteriorating frameworks. The intention was to invert the notion of ruin and reveal its positive and creative potential to pave the way for renewal and change as a gesture. Through enacting this ideated idiocy or self-abasing gesture of street cleaning, I encountered physical manifestations of the incomplete, unfinished, maintenance and failings in the institutional fabric, the forgotten and the misjudged, and form a visual language remarking on a condition of being. At first glance, these may seem like pointless acts, but I am exploring escape opportunities. What Gordon Matter Clark referred to, as we heard earlier, metaphoric voids, places where you stop to have a breather or tie your shoelaces, interruptions. I walked the contours of these evocative cultural sites as I did at Kilmahue, following the psychogeographic lines and shapes in my path, sensually sweeping the brush along the grooves and gutters and pavements of the selected sites. Palika Park and Skipper Tower have a strong resonance, even more so now having touched them, as they are spaces that were once part of this utopian master plan that Luchens envisaged. Institutionally cared for, but perhaps now more feral spaces slipping through the now warm municipal order and reoccupied by chance. In taking a line for a walk, or in this case a brush, I caress the surface such as with painting or drawing. The material, dust, is the medium and concrete the substrate. These acts are examples of doing and undoing and this interplay becomes the maxim of the process. And through that I made some drawings uh, back in the UK based on the geographic mapping that I had from my mobile phone of walks or just from memory following the map. 
given the reaction of the people I encounter in taking my practice to the street. This situated work seems to serve as a temporary sign, transmitting a joyous presence in and amongst the proposed sites. It also means encountering new audiences and creating art not about art, but an empowerment of a relationship and an application of an aesthetic of regular experience to other encounters in a wider field of action, the key aim of my creative work. These projects focused on architecture and site as metaphor for our own psychological conditions as humans, confronting the viewer with fragmentation and an incomplete project that perhaps is within our nature to shy away from. In this new work, however, an attempt was made to put into reverse the negative stereotypes of neglect, to invert it and create the potential for a more positive metaphor by cleaning, where art has become more like a system or an operation. The viewer is immersed in a set of visual relationships that subconsciously he or she is aware of to create allegories, new meanings, and to foreground the creative potential of the fragment in a process of renewal and redefinition. The visual narrative conjures the street cleaners who are welcomed like angels to the city and who engage in their task of removing the residue of yesterday's existence in a respectfully silent ritual that inspires devotion. And that's from Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino. This is perhaps because once things have been discarded, nobody really wants to have to think about them anymore. My project, in my project, the onlooker is invited to reflect on the ultimate outcomes of such accumulations of debris as an outcome of daily progress and thus question a wider logic around production and unbridled modernity. This question about what to do with our worldly possessions once we no longer have a use for them is as poignant today as it ever was. For example, my enactments pause, visualise and reflect on the status of the fragment within a potentially restored, embodied relationship with the world. Through the unfinished, I am disclosing ambivalence, what is missing or not being seen, a disappearance, if you like. And this is not necessarily a very easy feeling. I feel as though I'm occupying the role of a wandering performer, but unseen by any public. The American academic Christine Ross wrote in her wonderful book, The Aesthetics of Disengagement, through ambivalence, indifference is deployed as a condition of possibility. I'll say that again. Through ambivalence, indifference is deployed as a condition of possibility. In other words, possibility is revealed by disclosure of ambivalence, what is missing or not being seen. And art is more revealing in terms of a lack, I think, what is not there as much as what is. After all, the artist reveals gaps and doesn't fill them in. And the value of art today, its condition of possibility, lies in that very disclosure. That's according to Christine Ross. Discursive spaces linked and alert to architecture and cite as metaphors for our psychological states all refer to a place of our making and unmaking, both real and imagined, through positioning myself between creativity and fall, fiction and reality, an attempt is made to disclose the disproportion between the repetitious labour and the magnitude of the task on the one hand and the absurdity of the implements to hand and the meaninglessness other than its own taking place on the other. And in the words of Mira Laderman Eucles, the flushing up to consciousness of everyday practice, that of routine maintenance, flagging the void spaces to approach, address and attend. And these are some images from the um, 1970s, uh, early 70s, where uh, Eucales, this female artist, is engaged in her maintenance project as an important value to the excitement of avant-garde and unbridled industrial development. She promoted maintenance. She asked, after the revolution, who was going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning? 
Eucales, along with many other female conceptual artists, promoted the idea of artists as activists, challenging the privileged and gendered notion of art practice to form early and important works of institutional critique. She even joined the Department of Sanitation in New York City in 1977, and I believe she may still even be there as artist in residence. The last time I checked, a few weeks ago, she was. Why this merging of what is commonly seen as something with a high cultural status, i.e. art, with something with such a lowly status as routine maintenance, for example, cleaning? I would say it creates an entry point or a portal into Brodhair's field of distribution and enables a means of listening more closely to the hum of life. Ukulele's actions underscored the institution's contradictory role as a champion of artistic expression, cultural gatekeeper and preserver of the past. And to rephrase Helena Reckitt in her wonderful essay Forgotten Relations, Feminist Artists and Relational Aesthetics, my focus on the supplement of cleaning, in my focus in the supplement of cleaning, I am contouring culture's inscription within walls, floors and other architectural surfaces. The elements combine to reference unstable and subjective concepts of space and understanding and offer temptation around seemingly unstructured activities and makeshift actions that ultimately draw attention to the unresolved poetics of the everyday and the indefinable beauty in the ordinary. People stop and comment. They encounter my unsteady but progressive sweeping of a pavement, a gutter, something that was once a concrete space of modernity, which is now an abandoned and ruined husk. However certain the paradoxical undertaking of such projects may be, the works I enact are at least an attempt to delay being co-opted by the institutions that define art and that have dis traditionally distributed it. So to close with the words of Michel de Certo, I was able to link acts and footsteps, opening meanings and directions, and emptying them out of their primary role and historical order of movement as a means of articulating a second poetic geography on top of the literal forbidden or permitted meaning. And this is the last slide and I just wanted to end because um, this is like a new beginning for me um, where I'm thinking about this idea that I mentioned of how to not lose that um, that place of potential, that, that, uh, that indefinable space of potential within teaching, how do we manage to how do we manage to maintain that? So I've been thinking about art schools as heterotopias, but that's another talk. Mm -hmm. And the hidden curriculum, how do students learn in spite of the curriculum as well as because of it? I think there's as much learnt because of what we say uh, and despite what we say. And now that's probably oh, no, that's not contentious really. Uh, and the student as co-creator, I don't see students, I never saw myself as a consumer or as a vessel to be filled by a tutor. I always felt as if it was some kind of antagonistic or agonistic sometimes struggle. Uh, but thank you. Any questions I'm happy to take. <laughs>